technology has become pervasive in the world of business. It is a whole new way of working and executives need to be able to embrace the new world that their companies operate in and we as consumers live in every single day. It's something that we all deal with, whether it's personal or professional. Digital is a part of our lives. The job that I have today didn't exist five years ago. Technology has definitely driven a change at a faster pace. And I think too often you can look at technology in a narrow scope. Right? It's not just IT, but technology drives the business from the back end. So I think every business aspect of what you do has been affected. For my industry, we are seeing a lot of changes and need to have rapid, quick response with the access, having customer service management systems that allow constituents to report potholes quickly so that we can get the information and be as responsive as we can. I spent a lot of my time taking analytic approaches with data and being able to drive those decisions in the big data world. We need more leaders who can lead transformation, and I see the Mirage School as taking a big part in educating and turning out leaders who are ready and capable to do that. Is that all of our core courses have been completely revamped to address how technology disruption is impacting the various functional areas. And that enables our students to be more creative thinkers, more strategic thinkers about how technology disruption impacts businesses. One of the things I really appreciate and enjoy is how we actually learn exactly how we're going to be performing out in the business world. We're providing them with foundational skills in analytics. We are making sure that students understand that fundamentally it is our values that uh, drive good decision making. We have a great support system here between the faculty, staff. We all collectively understand that if one of us does better, we all do better. You really sense it from day one. Even your peers are all trying to work with you to find ways for you to improve yourself and to get the most out of the program. Our students and us within the Mirage Career Center are extremely fortunate to have numerous industries where either the individual corporate headquarters are located here or operations of large Fortune 500 organizations as well as startups here within the community. One of the biggest advantages that students would have here is just access to the field and access to professionals. The Mirage students stand out for us because they're immersed in kind of our Orange County cultural fit with technology and pharma and all of the industries that are really growing within our community. As an executive, you're engaged every single day in the war for talent. To run our company well, I want to encourage the best people to join. And so I like to have a relationship with the nearby business school. And the Mirage School is an excellent school. I've been able to recruit great people to come and join our organization. People have asked me why did I get involved in the Mirage School? And I think the real question is why wouldn't you get involved? The energy and the excitement of still being connected with all that knowledge is inspiring. To anticipate further disruption and to manage through that process is something that's critical. I'm pretty excited about this. You know, I think that's pretty cool. I, I really am excited. I, I, uh, I'm glad. I was worried when I put my suit on today that I was I couldn't remember which suit I had on in that picture and that tie and I'm like oh that's gonna be horrible if I wear the same one right but we got that covered so we'll move on but welcome everybody I'm really excited to have you here and uh, and I just want to say thanks to all the uh, the staff who helped to make that happen the employees the faculty the alumni the business leaders who were part of that okay so that's really great to be a part of that and that's just uh, that's kind of the world the world uh, debut of the, what's new and what's happening at the Mirage School, and we're pretty excited about it. And that's just the first of uh, of much of what we're doing uh, to to promote uh, and to uh, and to uh, make it make it known. Uh, tonight's event really is the official launch of uh, of what we're doing, and that's leadership for a digitally driven world. And that's what we're doing here in the Mirage School. And uh, you know, every top business school is hitting on digital a little bit here and there, bits and pieces. But nobody has done a complete shift, and they are differentiating entirely across the curriculum and across their extracurricular activities and the connections that we're making to the businesses and to and to the rest of uh, and, and the businesses in Orange County and to the rest of the world, like we've done here. And we've we've made this across everything that we're doing, and we're committed to that. And we're recruiting students along those lines. We're training our current students along those lines. Our faculty have changed their courses, and a lot of our research 
research is directed in that way. And you'll hear more about that tonight from Dr. Gurbaksani, but I, uh, I just wanted to say that, you know, with that redesign, uh, we, are, we are really leading in, in many ways. And why, why did we make this change? Because in 2012, we started the Center for Digital Technology, and, uh, and we engaged with CIOs, CEOs, tech people uh, throughout different industries, different verticals, and we found that consistently one of the things that, that students needed was that kind of exposure and that kind of training. And then I also, I engage with CEOs, CIOs, executives at every level. It doesn't have to be a C-level person. I talk to everybody that I get the chance to in Orange County and around the world, in fact, in, in many different countries, and ask them what are the kinds of challenges that they're facing? What do they need to actually make their businesses more successful, more competitive, and ultimately drive value and, or generate value and drive, and drive earnings for their companies. And consistently they're saying that what they need is they need their student, our students to learn so they can be their employees to learn the kinds of things to, that they need to, uh, to face a digital dis digitally disrupted world, to, to learn the kinds of skills, not just technical skills, but how to, how to engage people, how to engage people with different levels of, of uh, fluency, if you will, in, in digital kinds of things, in, 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 uh, and to be able to uh, derive what the problems are, identify what those problems are, and then to identify solutions, build teams, collaborate, create, and then to create, so, and then to come up with solutions and to drive value. And so, you know, we really are uh, looking at analytic decision making and using the power of the digital tools to help make this successful in our school and then so then our students, our graduates can be successful in their organizations. And there's no really better way to launch this initiative than tonight that we've got Jeff Earhart from, from GE with us and I'm not going to take much time here because there's more coming to, to, uh, with regard to introduction of him. But it's really, uh, it's, it's critical uh, to have somebody like this to give the perspective of what drove our decision to do this and what drives our commitment to this. Because GE is the company that is reinventing itself in this similar fashion, but it's not just the first time they've reinvented themselves. And this isn't the first time that the Mirage School has reinvented itself. And so it's kind of, there are a lot of parallels we're, a, we're a, just a few billion dollars short on budget from where they're at, but, <laughs> but, uh, and you know, and I'm not really much. Okay, yeah, I guess I won't. I, I, I already got the laugh. I'll stop there. All right, no, but, you know, uh, he's here to share how GE sees the world changing and how they're changing and how we uh, and and you in the audience should be changing as well. And uh, so that's I'm gonna I'm gonna leave the introduction to to somebody else here in a moment. But uh, before we hear from Jeff, I've got to thank those that make the events like tonight possible. I always have to say thank you. And uh, this year's sponsors of the Distinguished Speaker Series, we're honored to have the Allergan Foundation as a platinum sponsor again this year. So thank you to the Allergan Foundation. Let's say thank you. We have Paul Godby here tonight from the Capital Group, representing the Capital Group, and they're one of our gold sponsors. Thank you, Capital Group. And we have Laura Dang from Union Bank, and they are also a gold sponsor, so thank you, Union Bank. <laughs> and I think it's important to note that both of those people representing their respective organizations are, uh, are uh, alumni of the Palmerage School of Business, so that's great. Okay, and so thanks. I know there are a lot of other supporters here. You've supported us with time, talent, and treasure, so I thank you. You've, d you've done a great job, and, and I, we always want to say thank you to everybody who's been a supporter of us, not just corporate sponsors, but individuals as well. And uh, uh, we've got an overflow room. I know, I hope there's nobody in an overflow room that's name is on one of the seats in here, but this is the Dean's Leadership Circle uh, Auditorium. The Dean's Leadership Circle put this thing together with, uh, with many generous donations, so let's say thank you to them as well. Okay, so that, I, because we have a pretty packed uh, schedule and I want to give plenty of time to hear from Jeff, uh, I want to invite the Taco Bell Professor of Information Systems and Computer Science and the founding director of the Center for Digital Transformation, Dr. Vijay Gurbaksani, to hey, the thank stage. Thank you, Eric. Good evening, everybody. 
I couldn't, a little more energy. We haven't even heard the talk yet. Thank you. Um, I couldn't be more proud of our school today. It's just been an absolutely fantastic journey to get to this point. Um, you know, business schools, is, is no secret, are struggling with staying relevant. And the Mirad School has, just like we push all of you to do in the jobs that you're taking on and the companies that you lead, to think about digital transformation at your own company. And I'm proud to say that we are now joining sort of your uh, company in, in the way we are doing it. And kudos to Eric because, uh, you know, he led digital transformation of an earlier kind at Washington State before coming here with online delivery. And that was the first stage around sort of, uh, and he was a pioneer then. And one of the things you hear all CEOs talk about when they talk about digital transformation or adapting their companies is you have to be all in. This is not sort of a half, you know what, proposition. You really have to bet the farm. You have to put the resources where it matters. You have to redevelop your products and services, which in our case is our curriculum uh, and our research and all the outreach that we do. And we are all in thanks to Eric. So Eric, thank you for your leadership and thank you for sort of point taking our school to this, in this direction. Um, I want to recognize my colleague, Margaret Wiersum. I was sitting there in the middle of the auditorium because she and I have sort of worked very hard on, on the curriculum and Margaret did way more work than me. So thank you, Margaret, for that. Um, and, and, um, but you know, companies are struggling. Um, you know, you see sort of the news every single day. Uh, Amazon buys Whole Foods, and the next thing you know is there's a, believe it or not, a $35 billion drop in stock market valuation of the competitors. Kroger lost 10% on the day they announced the acquisition, another 10% on the day when they announced price cuts at Whole Foods, and they hadn't even done anything. And, you, you st and, and Kroger's actually pretty digitally savvy. So you think about how the world is changing, and, and this is something that we want to sort of impart to all of you, which is how do we become successful leaders, successful managers, successful entrepreneurs in, in, in this new environment? Um, what we thought we would do today at the, at the launch of this new brand is actually feature a company that is in the trenches as we speak, making this transformation. You know, GE is this company that is, you know, it was Thomas Edison's company. I mean, people need to remember that. That's where, you know, it's Thomas Edison's company. It's still around. It's been a nonstop member of the Dow Jones Index. And it's fighting for relevance, and it's doing really well on some dimensions. It's being challenged on other dimensions, but they are showing us the way. Um, and GE has been a really good partner to us. Bill Rue, who is the CEO of GE Digital, spoke at, the, at our conference two years ago. They've allowed us to interview them so we can think about our curriculum, and they're helping us with some of the design issues around our curriculum. So we're just really proud to have them as a partner in this journey, and uh, we hope we can teach them a few things, but I think we have a lot more uh, to learn from them as well. With that, I want to introduce Jeff Earhart, who is the VP of Intelligence Systems. And, there, and Jeff is sort of speaks to some of the transformation that, that uh, GE is going through. So uh, you know that GE is going through, they call themselves the world's premier digital industrial company. Jeff actually went to GE from an acquisition from a company called Wise.io, which is basically an AI-based startup. He will tell you much more about that. And before that, he was at Revolution Analytics, which was bought by Microsoft. And so here's a gentleman who sort of understands sort of how digital is transforming the practice of management, how it's changing strategy, and is sort of leading the transformation within GE itself. And we could think of no better person to sort of walk us through the story of what it actually takes um, for companies to transform themselves and position themselves for the new world. Uh, and then what we as leaders can do about it and what we in, as faculty should be teaching. So uh, J Jeff has an MBA from Wharton, an undergraduate degree in engineering from Cornell with 30 plus patents, which blew me away, uh, and has done some really interesting leadership work at GE and is now helping shape the future of GE. So with that, Jeff, thank you for taking the time to uh, spend this day with us and we really appreciate you being here and take it away. Fantastic, well thank you. All right, well, let's see, do I have a, this guy? Well, great, thank you, Vijay, and thank you for the introduction. It's really great to be here. Um, 
first of all, it's really exciting to see the launch of this center. Uh, we were talking, a few of us chatting beforehand, and I said, look, I don't have any answers. I only have my observations. And so I think it's really great to see uh, efforts like this come together to help bring some of these things together and provide guidance to the next uh, generation of people because there's only two sides of the same coin. So I'll share my experience, what I've learned, what I've seen, but certainly uh, everyone's experience will be different. So it's great to see this center come together to help bring that together. So. I wanted to start off, I'll tee things up in a couple different ways. Uh, I thought I'd give a little bit more uh, background on myself. I think Vijay did a great job on that already, but uh, to give you my perspective, uh, my bias, where do I come from, what is my experience that leads me to look at things the way I do, um, what I've done well, uh, the mistakes I've made, because those turn into the lessons about how we start to think about helping other organizations transform. I'll share a little bit about GE's journey, how they think about it at a broad corporate level, and then I'll dive down a little bit deeper and take a look at and share a little bit on my expertise. Uh, you know, I was introduced as leading our intelligent systems effort for GE. Uh, the buzzword around that is AI and machine learning. I was brought on board to help uh, lead those efforts, and there's a lot of interest around that, and I thought I'd talk about how we think about using analytics, advanced analytics, some of those technologies to drive this, this transformation, and then wrap up with uh, some of the lessons learned looking across my experience over the last 20 so years ago helping these companies transition, as well as I heard there was a few students around, although these are students, they look a little uh, mature, uh, but you know, share some of my personal career lessons as I've gone through this and some of the things that I think schools could uh, you know, really help people think about as well. So my journey, I started off, I'm not a real software guy. Uh, I started, I was trained in the physical sciences and I was a device physics guy. Uh, what I did though, as I came into old school manufacturing, uh, almost 20 years ago, I moved out to California in the mid 90s, uh, and I was asked to change almost immediately when I started my job. And I had a boss who had the idea that, gee, we're much smaller compared to this very large competitor. But I have the hypothesis that if we start bringing software to our R&D and manufacturing processes, we can gain some competitive advantage. And so we wanted to start up a team to do that. Uh, and then almost immediately everybody else left. And I was there by myself and asked to, uh, yeah, exactly, it didn't seem like such a good idea. And I had to make the choice, am I going to stay and try to make this happen or am I going to try to build it? Uh, what I ended up building was what today people would call big data analytics for IoT, driving the R&D and manufacturing of several billion computer chips every year. And what we were able to do is we were able to actually match and eventually surpass our very large competitor in a short period of time. And what that did is it really gave me the chance to understand how these technologies can actually give you a chance to be competitive, competitively advantaged when you are financially disadvantaged. So I did that for several years, turned it over to some other people, and moved on. I also have a background in finance, uh, and I got recruited back to help the company uh, go through a further transformation as the market was changing and uh, evolving around them. And I eventually ran uh, corporate development, helped them split the company in two, and spin out what was their uh, memory division help them spin up and become a small startup in this very rapidly changing world. Uh, but in some senses, it was less of a successful transformation. 2008 rolled around and saw what it was like for companies that couldn't innovate and change their business model fast enough. And my last hurrah for them was to run their bankruptcy and take the company from uh, north of 10,000 people to uh, a few thousand overnight to go through a restructuring to say what's the difference in the business model uh, that they couldn't do quickly enough because they didn't have the urgency. And I really started to learn what it meant and what the value of us having forcing function of crises. After that, I said I was out of the manufacturing and physical asset world forever, and I got into software. So I did my first software company. Uh, as many people uh, heard and have heard of the uh, open source language called R, I think uh, hopefully taught to all the students here. Uh, we were the commercial backers of our what's called Revolution Analytics. I spent uh, about four years of my life building around that company, selling into a large portion of the Fortune 500 and helping large organizations set up data science teams, analytics teams, and think about how can we gain this competitive advantage around analytics. Really interesting, but also really, really hard. And anyway, we sold that company to Microsoft. It's now being used to further perpetuate and build uh, the R brand. But my lesson from that one was, boy, it's really hard to sell tools and have everybody need to be an expert in building these things up. How can I gain nonlinear scalability in these advanced technologies, bring them to non-technical business 
people in a way that's still creating value for these organizations. And join forces with a team out of Berkeley, so to, please don't kill me, uh, to uh, build a company called Wise.io, where we were bringing machine learning uh, technology to the world, in particular of customer support and customer care. Uh, and that led to me joining GE. So I just celebrated my one year anniversary. So in this very large, very old company where people have worked there longer than I've been alive, <laughs> I'm a young one and it feels a little bit ridiculous for me to be talking about all of the lessons of GE's journey, but I'll share some of them anyway because you know, we make it up as so we go along. Anyway, uh, we'll start off and talk a little bit about uh, how do we think about and where did GE get to where they are. If you look at a, a sort of a very high macro level, what's happened over the last 10 years is industrial productivity has stalled. Other parts of the economy are going, the industrial economy is not. At the same time, to steal the Mark Andreessen quote, software is eating the world. And physical things are being connected. We take advantage and we take it for granted in other parts of the world that things are being integrated with software. That is starting to happen in the digital world. And so the challenge now for us and that we saw coming was that the people who master not just that connectivity, but understanding both the data and the insights coming off of those devices that are connected are the ones that will win and dominate in the next generation. And it gives us the opportunity to start to solve that productivity problem. So we serve aviation, healthcare, transportation, power. As somebody once described to me, we build the things that run countries. And even a 1% productivity improvement in those industries that we serve has the potential to create billions of dollars in value. And that's what we have the opportunity to do. So like they say in the movie, show me the money. Well, it's not that easy. The reality is, it's not so good. We hinted at, it's, gee, has been in the news. Our stock price is down, uh, whatever the number is these days more than 40% this year. There are headlines saying we are suffering a historically, catastrophically horrible year. Uh, the new CEO is pushing aggressive job cuts. But nobody said transformation was easy. So what I'll show and tee up over the next couple of pages is how we're starting to think about that, how we're starting to balance and manage this legacy business that has to go through transformation. Transformation was never easy with this gigantic digital opportunity that is in front of us. So the way that we think about this, and the problem was, we want to move fast. I'm used to dealing with startups where investors expect returns in a matter of a couple of years, where you can sell to a company and they onboard and they start using your product in a matter of quarters. But even five years as we think in this software-driven digital space, that's a short period of time for a company that has been around for 125 years, has 350,000 employees, has a presence in almost every country in the world, and has a history including inventing things like the light bulb, jet engine, and trains. And so as I come in as a new person, thinking about how do I help to change this company with things like artificial intelligence, if I don't recognize this history and understand what that means, I will fail. And that's some of the, the challenge and the struggle that you're seeing play out publicly in the market, is that while we think about short periods of time, the scale and the pace at which the industrial world moves is much slower and much longer. So the way that we've done that and sort of the playbook that we've applied to as a company is to think in three stages. Think first and foremost, we have to eat our own dog food. We think about, and we talk about GE for GE. First and foremost, what we build and develop must be used internally within this microeconomy that we have set up. Second of all, we think about GE for our customers. How do we use these digital technologies, solutions, and services to serve our customers better in the products and services that we already bring to market? 
with the end goal of eventually starting to open up to the world, is if we do those two things well, we can now start to serve the broader digital world and help other companies go through this journey. So the way that we've done that and how we thought about this organizationally is, in some senses, digital itself is not really new. There's many CIOs, we were having conversations beforehand. Digital technology, meaning software, software-driven parts of the business, has existed in most organizations for a long time in the form of IT and under the role of the CIO. The challenge is that was fundamentally internally facing. And it was also largely productivity and cost based on how it was thought about. And so what we recognized there was a need to set up a separate and a counterbalance role, which is now turned into a fairly common term of the CDO or the chief digital officer. And this one, rather than being purely internally focused and being cost driven, was about externally focused and being revenue driven. And so what we've had to work through and set up and figure out the incentives for and the organizational structure and get everybody to play nicely in the sandbox is what is the interplay between this CIO and the CDO? And so we're still working through that journey, but that's the structure that we have set up. So within that, our goal was to connect all of these systems to bring them together, to be efficient internally, to start to collect information off of all of our assets, to build the next generation of products and services for our customers. If you loop all the way backwards to the, one we were, uh, the page we were talking about a little bit earlier was the, these things have to be connected. The whole key to this is data and insights. There's very little interest and value in digitizing things unless you can take action on top of them. And so as you guys, as, as students and as faculty, think about why are we setting up or why have you set up a program in analytics, a master's program in analytics, it is collecting all this data is useless unless you tr can transform it into actionable insights. And so that's what I think about and why do they matter? Um, why do we need this concept of an intelligent system in industry? And the simple answer is that people don't scale. So this is a picture from uh, the Harvard Co College Observatory from, what's the date, uh, over 100 years ago. And this was about, uh, they called these computers, or the women that you see in the room there, looking at images. These were telescope images of the sky, looking for patterns. And at that time, because these were film images collected manually, you could just add people. But that no longer works. And so in this world where we are collecting ever more and more data needed to make decisions, we start to overwhelm the ability for humans to make decisions on top of that. Which then motivates us to what is this concept of an intelligence system? And the idea is, is that analytics done well, whether it's classical statistics, whether it's machine learning, whether it's AI, it needs to be embedded seamlessly within a product and workflow that is useful to decisions made by people. And so we like to think about an end-to-end -end application working robustly, securely, and at scale to continuously learn from the actions and decisions that people are making to both augment and automate critical business processes. And so that's really what the charter of my job is, is how do you take the expertise that exists within our business and start to implement it to accomplish this? So the way I like to think about this is, and we were having a, a discussion upstairs and offline about, well, what should you build? What should you buy? Um, should you partner with somebody? What does it mean to use technologies coming out of Google or Amazon or Facebook. And one of the things that I like to do, and as I start to help our company think through how do we look at these technologies, whenever there's something that's on the top of the Gartner hype cycle that has buzzwords and confusion, I like to distill it to its essence. And while people like to talk about fancy compute systems, distributed computing, Hadoop, AI algorithms, TensorFlow, uh, the Google uh, DeepMind team beating AlphaGo with their computer, those things are a bit of distraction. 
And in fact, as we think about building these intelligent systems, there's four things that need to come together. We do need to have that computing infrastructure. We do need to have those mathematical techniques. But very importantly, we need to have unique data and domain expertise. And so as we come together and think about on our journey as GE, where do we play? What do we put our effort? How do we help bring people through this? The most important thing I could help them understand is you don't need to compete on the left-hand side because other people have already dominated those and they're becoming commoditized. However, what we have that's unique and nobody else does is an incredible amount of domain expertise and data based upon all of the assets, products, and services that we have brought to the market over the last 100 plus years. The question then becomes, how do we think about that from a business model standpoint? And one of the hardest things and one of the most unique things for me coming in was here was this company that wanted to and talk about becoming a software company. Yes, we'd say the words digital industrial, but there was organizations set up to build and sell software. And one of the things that kind of frustrated me was as I came on board, you know, people said, well, GE's not a software company. Right? Um, we need to you know, build a platform, we're you know, platform driven, et cetera, et cetera. But if you look at the business models that have really made people successful over the last several years that are being funded in the valley, new companies started to bring down, to, to, to disrupt Oracle and Salesforce. It's the ones that are doing what's on the upper right hand side. Those that are delivering outcomes as a service based on data that has been aggregated across their customers. And then they turbocharge that with these intelligent technologies, AI and machine learning. If you look at that, GE is the company that invented that business model. And so the discussion is not, are we a software company or not? The question is, how do we become a modern, scalable, intelligent software company and stick to the business model that we made successfully and not play somebody else's game? So bringing those together, what I thought I'd share was a couple of lessons, not just from GE, but across the past several companies that I've seen, both as a provider to them, as somebody on the other side, et cetera, about the challenges that come in these digital transformations, where they go well, where they start to falter. And you've heard uh, several of them come out in the past several slides, focusing on business models. Know what you're good at. Uh, the people are going to be challenging, but I wanted to come back and highlight a few of them. So the first one is know who you are. And I really saw this uh, over my past uh, year or so at GE. It was the discussion around, are we a software company? Or are we an industrial company who is simply digitizing all of our products and services and providing better outcomes to our customers. It seems so obvious, but when you're told, go be digital, go be something else, go do something else, it's really easy to look tr lose track of that. Okay? But once you understand who you are, it allows you to focus on what you need to do next. The second one is, and maybe it's because I've lived my uh, life in technology with some rather uh, hyped uh, words around me. The technologies are not the end, they're only the means. They should simply be used to deliver a good product and service to your customers. I can't tell you how many CEOs and CTOs I've talked to that three years ago or five years ago were told, you need to do big data. Go buy Hadoop. Ask them how many of them are successful at this point and are now trying to figure out how to get a return on that investment. Okay, very few. The technologies are just a means, they're not the ends. It's a cliche, but the people really are the hardest part. And we were having a discussion again upstairs about the value and the power of a clean slate and the ability to build from scratch, whether it's technology, whether it's teams, whether it's culture, this is the hardest part, is how do you change people from what they're used to? And my approach, I said uh, two things. One is uh, 
I've no noticed two very powerful motivators. Number one is success, and the other one is jealousy. It's true, which is if you make somebody successful, other people get jealous. And if you celebrate that success, it gets much easier to squeeze out the challenge. The next one, another cliche. My mentors told it to me when I was uh, starting my first company. <laughs> you really will. You, you'll make the hard decisions too late. And usually they're tied to the prior slide. It's the hard decisions around people that you'll always make too late. Whether it's because you're, they're your friend, whether because they're tied to a critical product or a critical customer relationship, you know in your heart what you have to do, but you'll wait to do it. It never works out well. When you know in your heart you have to act, that's the best time to do so. The corollary to it is what we were talking about upstairs. Never let a good crisis go to waste. Uh, which again, the messaging to you know, my team and some other teams, with the news and the challenge and the changes going on, this is a fantastic opportunity for us as a company because it's forcing change that we may otherwise wait too long on. The last one is there's going to be doubters. There's going to be people that don't want to move along. You're going to hit bumps in the road. But the one true North Star that you have is your customers. And the only thing that I've learned is that if you can make customers happy, successful, and willing to say that to somebody else, whatever challenges you face, whatever doubters you have, will eventually go away. Amen. I knew there was a customer success guy in the audience. So those are sort of my thoughts on us as leaders and what I would love to see, again, we were having some discussion around how do we think about curriculum? What do uh, I as an executive want to see students uh, and MBA uh, candidates coming out knowing and thinking about? I would love them to think about and be, have the ability to navigate those type of challenges. What I thought I'd finish on before we switch to our panel discussion is share a little bit of personal ones. Um, hopefully there are maybe in the overflow room people who are getting ready to graduate thinking about how should I navigate my career and I thought I'd share a few of the things that that I've learned uh, both from uh, successes as well as from some of my own failures so the first one is and I don't this is an interesting one I'd love to you know hear some more feedback on this afterwards is everybody likes to uh, look down upon sales uh, the salespeople, they're off over there, they're playing golf, you know, they cost too much money. Uh, it's not a real skill. It's the single biggest thing that I wish I had been properly trained in and that I wish I had more people consistently and properly trained in. Every job at a certain level is a sales job. Second one. Again, we chatted about this a little bit upstairs. It's, it's uh, like I said, you guys took all my good lines. But I was lucky uh, in my first job that six months in, my boss and my other colleagues left. I didn't know what to do. But I knew I could hire some people. And I learned to get comfortable with hiring people who were better than me. And I've since managed the rest of my career being comfortable with I don't know how to do what the people working for me do. And we were talking upstairs about the pace of change and what it means and can you teach today what somebody 20 years will, will need to know how to do. And I'm utterly convinced the answer is no. And if you come in and you feel like I need to be the expert in the room and I am uncomfortable having people who can do my, not only my job, but do my job better than me, it's going to be a very tough career. The next one, cherish the people who are willing to tell you the hard things. Once you rise to a certain level, it's going to stop. They will never go away. You can't change it. But the first time I had somebody pull me aside and say, you know what? People think you're an asshole. <laughs> OK. You can laugh. It's, it's true. That was a real conversation. I at least knew that I needed to 
work on that, manage that characteristic of myself, and surround myself with people who could help counterbalance that. Because once you're the boss, once you rise to a certain level, nobody will tell you that, but I guarantee it still exists. Okay. Next, I don't believe in career plans. I think the best opportunities are the ones you didn't expect. But they take a lot of courage to say, I'm going to leave my comfortable job and go pursue this other opportunity. And then finally, I also don't believe that those who seek success are very rarely or are rarely successful in finding it. And I believe that the best way, it's much like the customer success and customer referrals, to find success is to find somebody else who is successful. Think about that Ralph Waldo Emerson quote. And let them help you become successful in turn. So that's it. Thank you very much. I think we've got time for some discussion. I would love to uh, hear your questions and continue the dialogue. So thank you, everybody. It's been great to be here, and hope you enjoyed it. Young muscle. We didn't get into those lessons. Wow. I think we're going to need digital seats the next time we do this. Thank you, Jeff. That was really interesting. Um, so, so I have to sort of. It's all, it's all good. I, it's, it's all good. But no, I was, I was actually thinking about my next line, to be completely honest, because I have heard I don't know how many management talks in my life. I've been here 32 years. But I have never heard one that quotes, quotes Jake Krishnamurthy, who's a Hindu Vedanta philosopher. And so. Kudos for that. Well, uh, I will say that. So th there is a story to that one as well, which is, uh, so at Revolution, the guy who recruited me was a, uh, he was actually the founder of a company called SPSS, so very well known. He uh, uh, ran the political science department at Stanford. First uh, investor in his company was Milton Friedman. And when I came there, so I guess this could have been one of the other lessons, the first thing he said to me, he said, what have you read in the last week? And I kind of stumbled. I didn't have an answer. And he said, you cannot be an executive, unless you are well-read. So. And that's one of those. And so I learned it as a child as know thyself, because you know when it's religious, they make it more formal. Uh, um, but you know, so, so actually, one of the, playing off that, um, you said something that I thought was very, very powerful, which was, um, you know, yes, we focus on becoming software companies. But what you really said is you have to know the essence mm -hmm. of what it is that differentiates you as a company. Yeah. And then go ahead and leverage that in software. Yeah. Um, and because the digital platforms make that very easy to scale. Mm -hmm. So can you help us sort of can you drill down into that? Because you know, obviously there's Predix, there's the, yeah. the sort of the digital twin, and all these things that you're doing at GE. Yeah. Can you talk a little more specifically about what you're doing at GE? Just pick one division that you will. Or yeah, I, I think we could uh, talk about a couple divisions. But again, that essence of what do we do? So let's take our, our uh, aviation division. So it's fairly well known uh, that uh, in that division, so we at any point in time are responsible for roughly 60% of the uh, uh, airplanes that are in the air, meaning mm -hmm. the engines that power them. And we don't make most of our money selling those engines. We make most of the money servicing them and providing uptime, reliability, performance over the next 20 or 30 years of their life. And that comes back to that whole discussion we were talking about of what does it mean to create one of these intelligent systems, that it's not just the component parts, it's how they come together with unique expertise and domain data, and then what is the business model? And 
again, to be completely transparent, a big part of the discussions that I've been having with colleagues, executives, uh, you know, general managers, CEOs of the businesses is exactly that, which is we don't have to search for a new software-driven business model. We have one at our fingertips that we're already great at. So at a large company like GE, so it's actually noteworthy that GE actually has, at least in my mind, the right vision and is sort of clearly adapting itself. What were the major sort of roadblocks um, along the way? Because I know you've launched a GE digital division, you've yep. got the GE store, but yep. there's a lot of things you guys are doing, but obviously uh, some things are working better than others. So what, what's the lessons around sort of specific strategies and tactics? Yeah, I, I, would, I would say a couple things. So first is, uh, again, this strategy was really uh, uh, hatched under our uh, prior CEO, Jeff Immelt, and he's uh, been, at it, had been at it for several years. And I think the biggest challenge that he faced was one of expectations. Um, coming in as a Monday morning quarterback, I can't critique many things. Uh, we did many of the right investments. We invested reasonable amounts of money. I think the hardest part was, what are the expectations that were set with how quickly this will happen. What's become clear is that the industrial world is not the same as the consumer world, is not even the same as the enterprise software world. And for us and for our peer companies to deal with national critical infrastructure, to deal with healthcare, to deal with the power systems that you know, run entire countries, the changes that happen in that world just happen at a different pace. Yeah, and you talked about GE for GE, GE for customers and so on, and GE for the world. So were your customers, are your customers ready? Uh, they, I guess it depends on the industry, of It course. depends on the industry. So the answer is they are ready to change. They are not ready to be fully digitized. And one of the more interesting experiences for me was, and this comes back to what is your essence, what is your brand, Many of our customers are looking to partner with us and buy software from us and products simply to help them through that journey. They recognize that it is hard. They recognize they don't know what to do. And they recognize us as being one of the most, if not the most successful, traditional industrial companies going through that journey. And so they are looking for us to help them lead that through that process. And, but you know, we hosted a, a gentleman from Kodak at, at our last conference, and he talked about sort of why Kodak failed. And it yep. wasn't for the reasons that people thought. They had actually the vision. As he put it, they hired me to run the division. Mm -hmm. And we didn't do a, a, a good job at it, and, and largely because they didn't have the competencies that Kodak needed. So they were, didn't understand the ecosystem world. Mm -hmm. They didn't understand a world where the economies of scale actually one of the chip manufacturer, not to them. Mm -hmm. um, what are the, you know, from a GE perspective, clearly with acquisitions like, like yours yeah. uh, of Wiser.io and actually yeah. a bunch of other acquisitions, yeah. uh, they're acquiring the capabilities from the outside. But, and we're seeing a lot of industrial companies make those plays. Yeah. Um, what do you see as sort of the capability shortage in companies, large industrial companies today? Yeah, I, I would say it, it comes back to one of the pages that I put in there, which is the people really are the hardest part. And the important part is acquisitions can be useful for bringing specific technologies and expertise in. Acquisitions are also really hard to do. Mm -hmm. uh, they're really hard to not kill and have the body reject the organ transplant. Sure. On the flip side is you don't want to do so many acquisitions that you push out and devalue all of the expertise that made your company so successful in the first place. And so I think the balance now that we're going through as a company is how do we not have it be digital versus industrial, which the natural uh, conversation would be, but rather how do we bring the best parts of two of those, which is modern software engineering practices, merged with industrial product and domain expertise. So increasingly, I think you're saying that there is a thesis that GE, just like Mark Andreessen, yeah. which is software is eating the world. Yeah, software is eating the world. So now let's peel that onion a little bit, which is uh, software is going to be everywhere in the world. 
I don't believe that that means that physical things go away. Correct. I think what it means is, is that who and where and how value is captured radically changes. So in our case, and the great value is things like power generation, things like air travel, things like oil and gas exploration, are unlikely to go away in the foreseeable future. The question is, as they become digitized, who captures the value in that may change. And that's what we need to think about as a company. Right, and I think I would argue that increasingly the value capture is, is going to sort of uh, the people with the best sort of insights from the best data. Uh, I agree. So firms with the best data win. We see that in industry, you know, we study this at the center and, and, and we see this in industry after industry after industry. Um, mm -hmm. um, I'm going to switch gears on you a little bit uh, because I found sort of this interesting quote from Jeff Immelt that said, um, G's belief used to be that a good manager can manage anything. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and now they're coming, it seems like, at least from the article, they're coming around to the belief that now it's not just being a good manager as, as, as a generic toolkit or generic set of capabilities. It's much more about the domain, and you need to sort of understand just the domains. You need to have some foundational understanding in digital capabilities. What's your view on that? My view is it depends managing what and when in its life cycle. Uh, I b do believe that for products, for businesses, on which there is a history a template and expertise. There is general management expertise that can continue to make those successful and innovate on top because there is the organizational infrastructure and know-how in place. I think that's challenging for bringing new capabilities to market. Mm -hmm. uh, and there is absolutely domain expertise and I think the concept that any person any manager can come in and build something new from the ground up, I think is challenging, and I think we are now realizing and learning that as a company. So, since you, know, you acknowledge that we have a lot of students both here in this room and in the mm -hmm. overflow rooms, what's your advice, and I know you sort of touched on this already, for soon to be graduating students, undergraduates, MBAs, uh, in terms of how they should be preparing your literature to that, but let's, let's expand on that a little bit, because that, I suspect, is why a lot of our... Yeah, we could probably take much more than the last five minutes on that, but uh, we hinted at a few of them, uh, which is, uh, you know, think broadly, not just about specific technologies, about how you're going to continue to learn, how you're going to lead teams where people will come in with new skill sets. Back to that managerial question that you answered. I do think that is a competency, but it's a different type of competency. Uh, thinking about customers. I think is very important. Uh, I think thinking cross-functionally, building teams is very important. But the last one that I would bring out that uh, hasn't uh, been talked about so much, and maybe affects me more from where I live, being in the Bay Area, being in, in San Francisco, is everybody wants to graduate and start a company. And one of the things that, uh, in, and I think schools face the challenge as well, they've become sort of glorified incubators. Uh, if you look at some of the schools up there, and as I talk to, to, to faculty and, and uh, you know, administrators uh, there, I don't think people should have aspiration to become a fake CEO. I uh, run into people every day at the coffee shop that is a CEO of a one-person company. And <laughs> well, I'm serious, it's, it's, it's a true statement. Uh, and I don't think that's really a path to career success. Um, we have a, a lot of survival bias in when we, we see people that dropped out of Harvard and you know, founded a billion dollar company or you know, graduated their first job and taught themselves how to do things. I think there's a tremendous amount of value to come into a moderately mature, well-functioning, scalable organization and learn how things are done properly before then iterating applying that to your own ideas and opportunities. Yeah, I think we would agree with that because you know, one of our first, you know, first eye at this school is, is intrapreneurship too because I think it's the large companies um, that, that need help in many ways. And, 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 and this, you're right, the survival bias, the survivor bias is, is incredible, right? Because nobody here is if the 100 failures for, um, well, I actually did think of one last question. I want to loop back to G and then I'm gonna throw it open. So please plan your questions for us. 
Um, because you started with this conversation about stock price and mm. the pressure that you, so I want to go back to that because, mm. you know, Amazon gets a pass. Yeah. You know, they can invest in whatever the heck it seems like they want to invest in. Everybody says, Jeff says smart, Jeff Bezos, yep. and, and Jeff Earhart. Uh, 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 and, and, and he gets a pass. Elon Musk, to some degree, I think, you know, if any other company had the production slowdown with the Tesla mm -hmm. Model 3, it would have been hammered, but sort of, there's, there's something about their investor base, understanding their risk profile as companies. Uh, GE seems like a different um, sort of entity in the way it's being treated. So, so expand on that and what you can do to sort of manage expectations that you alluded to before. Uh, yeah, I, I think that's, it's, it's a really hard question. I have the same observation, and if I had the solution, I guess my pay grade would be a little bit higher. Um, it, 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 it's, it's really hard, and I think uh, uh, the challenge is you get what you attract. And we ultimately were a, uh, and, and have been for much of our lives, a, a value play and a value stock, and we had value-based investors that were hoping uh, and believing that we would be able to go through this digital transformation. And I think the, what we're seeing now, and seeing both with that investor base, uh, as well as you know, what's available publicly in, in, in the news, is that that's happening slower than expected. And that's not necessarily a problem uh, in that it certainly is gonna take time. We have a very large, profitable set of businesses for which uh, the stock price is getting hammered simply because of expectations. There should be enough finance people in the room to uh, figure out our market's always efficient, the stock price is all, always fairly priced. Uh, the question is, you know, what are you discounting back about what might happen in the future? future right? And our guys uh, simply uh, you know, discount with a, uh, a higher rate on stuff that might happen further in the future, whereas right, wrong, or indifferent, Amazon and, and the like have been able to play that game for longer, so. Well, good luck with your venture. If we could turn the house lights up just a little bit so we can see who's got their hands up. Uh, but I'd like to turn, open it up to the floor for questions. Um, and we have runners with mics, but at this point, we're completely blinded by the spotlights. There we go, perfect. Um, questions? In the back there? Hi, uh, thanks for coming out. Y you spoke earlier about surrounding yourself with people that are more talented than you. How do you hold on to them and keep them engaged? Yeah, that's uh, both an art and a science in and of itself. So I think there's, uh, and, and I'll just speak from personal experience. You know, I'm recruiting in a, a very technical field where all the numbers have been published. There is a massive shortage of uh, people uh, in my field, such that uh, I was uh, talking to some guys at one of the large sort of tech companies in the Bay Area, well known. Uh, that said, if you are from a certain school, graduating with a PhD in one of these fields, some type of machine learning, et cetera, you get an automatic seven-figure offer. Um, that's, yeah, pretty tough, pretty challenging. Um, you have to be price competitive on salaries, but that's not why people join or why people stay. And what we've done, uh, and part of what we've done, is created a vision and a different vision for people where, yes, GE is going through hard times in the news. Uh, the stock price is down. Uh, it's got a more traditional way, sort of in the legacy customer base, about how it thinks about managing employees. But on the flip side, uh, we have the opportunity to, and you have the opportunity, to be part of a much larger mission which is doing work that hasn't been done before, creating a team uh, that uh, was the equivalent of the teams that were built in Facebook and Google and Baidu, et cetera, and giving the opportunity to move the needle on one of the largest and most venerable companies in the world. So if I can create that vision, number one, and if the second uh, point we made was about uh, using other people to sell for you, uh, if you can get other people on the team to actually say that that's true and it's not me as the manager doing so, it becomes a self-fulfilling wheel. And one of my core beliefs, we didn't talk about this, is the most important job of a manager, 20, 30% of his time, should be recruiting the next generation of people. And so, Over there. 
Good evening. Um, you mentioned that GE is looking to marry uh, digital with industrial. Uh, what's GE's role going to be in the uh, China's Belt Road Initiative, if it plans on having one? I'm not familiar with China Belt Road. Uh, OBAR, uh, the maritime shipping lanes that they're going to do over land and sea, uh, follow the old trade routes. Ah, got it. So I'm not familiar with that and uh, uh, can't speak to any specifics around it. Uh, I've done some work on that in a prior life and be happy to talk about it offline, but I don't have an official corporate answer on it. Wait for the mic, please. Uh, what are the measures you've taken or GE has taken that has helped people transition from an analog to a digital mindset. Uh, I know there was an announcement at, at some point of teaching everyone to code. Is that something that's successful or what have you seen that's really been able to change kind of the culture and the processes uh, towards this digital transformation? Yeah, so certainly there's been some efforts around that. You, you can think of, uh, I, I tend to bucket them in two categories. One is how do you assess uh, skills and then train people for those new skills? Uh, and then how do you recruit those new skills in? And I think both of those need to occur in balance. And that's part of what makes these transitions so difficult and take so long. Come back to sort of the, the point I was making on the people are the hardest part. That's a big part of it. Um, I, 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 my personal experience is that the success rate with transitioning people who may have been in a traditional IT role into a modern software engineering role is uh, less than 100%. Um, and so the question is, how do you manage them in this large organization? And how do you get the right people aligned with the right roles, aligned with the right tools? And that's simply a, uh, a learning curve that organizations have to go through as they get more comfortable with not everything can be solved with retraining and giving easier to use tools. So is GE requiring its new hires to know how to code? Or? Uh, in certain fields, yes. So not all new hires, uh, uh, obviously, in, in, in marketing and, and some of the business functions are not. But certainly on the technical side, absolutely. And we actually uh, interview for it, we test for it, uh, et cetera. This is a question over there. Okay, we need questions from the middle here, too. But we'll, we'll get to you, Leonard, in a minute. Uh, hi, good evening. I come from a power utility industry. We're 125, 130 years, very similar to GE. We sp you spoke a lot about the automation technologies of really connecting the physical assets to the you know, uh, intelligent software systems in order to really get better and gain a competitive advantage. Yeah. The question that I have is you know, for organizations like ours, power utility companies, mm -hmm. We've been in business for such a long time uh, with antiquated systems in the past often. What that means is the data, there's a lot of domain expertise, but the data on which we are sitting may not necessarily be the most um, accurate or valuable. There have been years and years of history of, um, uh, you know, you could call it as laziness or nobody cares about data. And, and what has happened is you pretty much can think about majority of these old, large companies where they're sitting on huge volumes of data that may not necessarily be the most consistent and accurate, mm -hmm. accurate and the positioning of this data mm -hmm. for you to actually mine with this new automation technologies kind of gets deprecated. Yep. So what kind of strategies? You know, there's so much focus around deploying these predictive technologies, yep. you know, applying this, uh, machine automation and artificial intelligence, but there doesn't seem to be enough discussion in terms of strategies companies need to adopt to really um, cure this data yep. or position this data in a manner their companies can really drive value. Yeah, so absolutely. do you have anything to say on that? Sure, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. And uh, you know, there's probably a magazine cover that comes out uh, on a weekly basis, that's uh, data is the new oil. It's uh, you know companies should uh, you know th they should protect it at all costs, uh, et cetera. And frankly, it it a little bit drives me crazy uh, for the the reasons that you just hinted at. Data itself has no value. Uh, unique data 
that is clean, good, and relevant applied to specific business problems does. And so uh, that's the first point I would make. The second point I would make is you're also exactly right in that the answer may be the types of data that you're talking about in terms of, of uh, um, running a particular asset or business or solution, it's not obvious that the right thing to do is for every company to build and run that themselves. And so again, one of the things that I think about and spend a lot of time talking about both internally within the company as I talk about executives uh, of other companies is what are the right things to build versus what are the right things to buy? And again, the classic you know, business school case studies, you, you build what's your unique core competency, you buy that which is not. And so again, as we think about then internally within GE, it comes back to think about that business model one that I talked about, which is not delivering tools to companies like yours to go try to do it yourself, but rather to build software solutions upon which we can understand the patterns across many different customers and deliver outcomes to you. Because I don't think what you're hinting at is your company doesn't have the skill set nor the desire to be in the software building business. But you're probably really good at running power services. And if we can provide you solutions that solve your problem without forcing you to build that yourselves, I think we're both better off. We have a question over here. Thank you for coming today. tonight. It was really interesting. Uh, GE invested a fair amount of time, effort, and money in both FastWorks and Lean Startups. And uh, we're, we're you're sitting, as you're sitting there now, I kind of like to get your opinion of you know, what worked and what didn't in that process. Yeah, to me, those are all about uh, awareness and thought processes. Uh, you know, what works well is getting people to think about and be aware that there is different modern, I know that's a loaded term, way of doing things. Um, what I find less successful, again, one of those terms that is a little bit loaded and I'm not a fan of is, uh, oh, it's good to fail fast. And again, I think you know, we were talking upstairs about that being, you know, to me that feels like something the VCs, you know, created to uh, create a portfolio of companies and uh, cherry pick the one that worked well and have the rest go away. When you're dealing with real products, real customers, uh, uh, um, in mission critical, life and death kind of situations, the concept of I'm gonna fail as fast as possible, I think is a little bit challenged. But getting people to be aware and understand that things can move quickly, that you should think about loss functions, how you take risk, I think has been very successful. So we have time for one last question over there. So, hi Jeff, and hi Vijay. So, you know, in a digitally driven world, you know, as we face, you know, successful companies either are disrupting existing industry or actually sometimes replacing existing industries. And GE, as you've shown in your slides, has a major positions, you know, say, powers, power plants, I think, or power generations. Yep. And you also mentioned the transportation. And those two industries actually are going through major disruptions. For yep. example, solar power and energy storage, yep. and Wall Street Journal had an article about the power pack where individual home can have a power packs yep. and completely eliminate the power grid and power plants out in the future. And so I was just wondering, and transportation, you know, Elon Musk, and the Hyperloop, and all this other stuff, well, you're still stuck in the locomotives and trail and things, things like that. So what is GE's position along that line? Yeah, so I, I can't share, uh, and I don't have personal knowledge of anything that's non-public. Uh, the way I would, I would respond to that, though, is you're exactly right. I mean, what you just described is uh, you know, the innovator's dilemma. Uh, and it's a real thing. And seeing it play out from the inside of companies is fascinating. Uh, the only reason why I'm still there is 
A, it's interesting to watch, and B, <laughs> this is a company that has gone through that reinvention uh, a half dozen times or more over its life cycle. And I don't know what the answer is, and maybe, uh, you know, yes, uh, between Hyperloop and solar, uh, the company won't figure out how to do it, but uh, uh, I'm actually pretty optimistic, and, you know, yes, we're not thinking about Hyperloop, but uh, we, uh, rest assured, we have people, you know, thinking about what are the technologies, the business models, uh, and the digitization that's needed around those things. So uh, I'm as excited to watch it as you are because it's exactly the right question. So with that, thank you all for coming. Let's thank Jeff for his insights. We'll, we'll continue the discussion outside. There's a nice reception for all of us. And if Jeff can stay a few minutes, we would love to interact with him more. Thank you again, Eric, for hosting this. And thank you all for coming.